I have I have overdone it this time. I got like 70 slides here. Don't worry, we won't do them all today. They'll be spread out over the next week. Um, but I got a lot of material to go through, so we're going to go through a whole bunch of stuff today, which means I'm not going to nag you with questions about problems yet. So you can just sit back and take notes and all that good stuff. Um, <clears throat> I do have to mention that if you look at the syllabus, there will be an exam next week. I know, you're so excited. So there'll be an exam given out a week from today. It'll be due on the Friday afterwards. It'll cover the usual stuff, including all the stuff I'm going to be talking about today. You know there will be some triple point questions on there. Um, there will be some sex linkage questions, the kinds of things that we'll give you in the homework to do over the weekend. And uh, yeah, this stuff will be in here. So what we're talking about today, we're going to go back to chromosomes a little bit. Remember way back at the beginning of the semester, that's where I started us off. I told you about all, the, all this work being done in the late 19th century, figuring out chromosomes, their structure, puzzling out whether they had anything to do with genetics at all. And yeah, they do. Uh, all this stuff was going on back then. We're coming back to it today because what I want to talk about now is since we know that genes are associated with chromosomes, and since Morgan figured out that you could actually map genes on chromosomes, it turns out that what chromosomes do is pretty important. That there can be variations in chromosome structure, for instance, that affect the inheritance of characteristics. All right, so last time, I, you know, way back when, I showed you this. You know, we can look at chromosome pictures all day, karyograms, ideograms, all that cool stuff. We talked briefly about chromosome numbers that we, for instance, have 46 chromosomes, that is 23 pairs of chromosomes. So that's all right there. Other organisms have different arrangements. So you might surmise that, hey, maybe these, maybe these chromosome arrangements mean something. We talked a little bit about this, remember ploidy. So that's the numbers of the complete chromosome set. And there's two categories. Euploidy is the number of chromosomes is an integral multiple of the haploid number. So we've got our gametes, which are haploid. So in humans, each gamete has 23 chromosomes. And then we have our adult forms, which are diploid. So those all have 46 chromosomes. In a perfect world, that's what happens. You get 23 out of gamete, 46 in adult. Uh, however, there are also these conditions called aneuploidy. We'll come back. Aneuploidy, which is where you have variations in the number. This just means that you have a non-integral multiple of the haploid set. So the haploid set is 23. Euploidy includes chromosome, 46 chromosomes, it includes 69 chromosomes, etc. And euploidy means there's some deviation from that. So for instance, if you've got only got 45 chromosomes, you are aneuploid. That's not an integral multiple of 23. Most common conditions people talk about are monosomy where you're missing one particular chromosome, or trisomy, where you have three copies of a particular chromosome. Okay, again, emphasizing this. If you have, if you have a multiple number of haploid chromosome sets, that means you're euploid. You could be pentaploid, and you're still a euploid. That is, you could have five times 23 is 115 chromosomes. In the case of a human, you'd be dead. None of those survive. Dosage is so far off. But that would be a euploid organism. And aneuploids just have a few or missing chromosomes. 
So we've got a, a method of designating those. So here's a human, 2n is 46. If they have an extra chromosome 21, that would be designated as 47 comma plus 21. So you can just see that and instantly know, okay, this is, there is the variation in their chromosomes that occurred. Also, a person missing part of the petite arm of chromosome 5. We have a designation for that. It's 46 minus 5p. So we, we can even specify when we're missing just portions of a chromosome. If you're missing all of chromosome 5, you would be 45 minus 5. All makes cle all clear. We'll be using this periodically for a while here. Uh, this individual is dead, by the way. We don't have any uh, monosomies of that sort that survive. Uh, this one, as we'll see in a moment, actually does survive to adulthood, but it, these individuals are severely messed up. And uh, we also know that you can have an extra chromosome 21 and make it to adulthood. Anyone know what we also call this? Down syndrome. So that's what this is, is just having an extra chromosome 21. So Down syndrome people are trisomic for chromosome 21. All right, how do we get these? We mentioned this before too, this, this process of non-disjunction during meiosis or mitosis. This can also occur in mitosis, don't forget. Uh, we get a division in which these are two homologous pairs that are supposed to separate like that. They do properly over here. But both sets of chromosomes go to one, one daughter cell. This daughter cell is left devoid of that particular chromosome. And then we go through the second meiotic division and we get this arrangement. For this here, we just see this is, the, this is where the non-disjunction occurs in the second division. So this is a gamete. If it then is, is fertilized by or fertilizes a normal gamete, one that has the appropriate number of chromosomes, you would end up with three copies of whatever chromosome this is in that zygote. On the other hand, if this particular gamete were to fertilize a cell that had the appropriate number of chromosomes, that is, it's only supposed to have one of these chromosomes, um, then you would have an adult that is monosome for that chromosome. So this is something that happens fairly routinely. It's pretty easy for it to occur, and it leads to uh, lots of lots of problems. Now, why should it lead to problems? What's so bad about just having an extra chromosome or losing just one? You got you got a spare, right? So every one of you, you've got two co copies of chromosome seven, for instance. So what if you lose one? You still got the other one, right? It's a backup. Uh, what if you gain another one? You got three copies of chromosome seven. That sounds even better. You got all the you got all these redundancies. Then you don't have to worry. Well, it doesn't work that way. There's a couple things that are terrible about non-disjunction. Okay, monosomy. First of all, it means that all the genes on the remaining chromosome. So, for instance, you've only got one chromosome seven instead of two. That means all the deleterious alleles on chromosome 7 are now exposed. So that individual is going to express any possible deleterious alleles. It's not a problem if they're perfect, right? If there are no deleterious alleles, then you don't have to worry about it. But in this case, what it means is that, oh, come back. It means you're going to unmask any possible potential deleterious effects. So that's not good. We already know of one example. Men, right? We've, we've got one X chromosome. That means if you've got a deleterious allele, like for instance, colorblindness, you're going to be colorblind if that's the only X chromosome you got. 
But then there's other problems, and these are probably the bigger ones, uh, because obviously males survive even with one X chromosome, right? But the other problem is dosage. That you need the proper doses of all these gene products delivered at appropriate times for development to occur normally. In the case of the X chromosome, that's a special case because in the X, case of the X chromosome, uh, we've evolved compensatory mechanisms. So the normal state in a human being is to have only one functioning X chromosome and have all of its gene products produced in a, in a concentration appropriate for one X chromosome. And so what we've done, we, that's a very grand we, over evolutionary time what has happened is that we've compensated for that in that females shut off one of their X chromosomes. So they only have one operational one. You all remember that? Barbet bodies and all that. So if you are monosomic and trisomic though, especially for a chromosome that does not have that kind of built-in, evolved, compensatory mechanism, uh, things are out of whack. Now think about making a cake. Can you go in and make a cake and just say, oh, well, today I think I'll use twice as much flour in this cake. Or I think I'll leave out half the sugar. You do that sort of thing and you get a, you get a cake out of it. It's probably not going to be, be a very tasty cake. Same here, you need the right dosage of all those gene products. So in most animals, almost all aneuploidies lead to death. You just don't make it. There are some exceptions. We're going to talk about some of those exceptions. But also some animals are more tolerant. Amphibians in particular seem to be just fine with being polyploid, having extra copies of everything. Um, and they'll develop just normally. They seem to have acquired other mechanisms to compensate for dosage. But in the case of us mammals, nope, we, d we don't work that way. Sorry, you mess up the number of chromosomes, you mess up all of development. Also, as it says here, plants are a heck of a lot more tolerant. I guess that means they're more advanced, right? They get, they get some kind of mechanism that allows them to tolerate all this variation and produce a, a healthy, viable outcome. But no, we mammals just de can't do it. Okay, one, one way we try to compensate for it, we mentioned already, uh, this is the um, formation of bar bodies, inactivation of the X chromosome, you all recall that, right? So in mammals, the homogenetic sex, the females compensate for this by inactivating one of their X chromosomes to produce something called a bar body. There's a bar body right there. And that's just a neutralized X chromosome. It's got very little function. Keeps the dosage on an even keel, so both men and women are operating just fine. Okay, so we got this mechanism. If it goes wrong, mammals are incredibly intolerant of variations in the system. We humans are supposed to have 46 chromosomes, and if we don't, uh, it causes all kinds of problems. This is, this is a tragic sort of table. So this is, uh, this is obtained in hospital pathology wards. If some unfortunate woman delivers a child that is stillborn or has a spontaneous abortion, doctors will scoop up that, that little fetus and they'll subject it to all kinds of analyses to try and figure out what went wrong. This isn't just scientific curiosity, of course. It's because the mother wants to know what happened? Why didn't my pregnancy terminate viably? Why did we have these problems? So what they do is they will dissect it on a cellular level, ask what's wrong with it, 
And there's a long list here of things that can affect the development of a fetus and can lead to spontaneous abortions. Uh, one is chromosome abnormalities. Those are easy to assay. You pull out a couple of cells from the fetus, you put them on a microscope with a chromosome squash, you count chromosomes, you say, oh, there, isn't, there, are, there aren't 46 chromosomes here. So something went wrong. There was a non-destruction of some sort that went on. And like you see here, about 6 or 7% in some studies have found that that's, that's the cause. Another possibility is mutations. This is harder to assess. You have to go digging pretty deeply to figure out you know, what genes were messed up in this individual. But yeah, they're there. They're 7 to 8%. Primary causes of mutations. Uh, there's a couple. One is just background radiation. So, you know, we've got, we've got radiation coming out of the ground here. So if it's, you know, at a low level, it's much higher in the Rocky Mountains. And that can lead to spontaneous mutations. Another one is environmental factors. Again, uh, you go poking around in this, this poor dead fetus and you discover you can't find anything wrong with its chromosomes. But there are also common suites of uh, phenotypic effects that you can assess. For example, a common one is fetal alcohol syndrome. If you look into mom's history and she says, well, yeah, every weekend I go out and get bombed. <laughs> And she does this through her pregnancy. There's a set of things that happen that can affect the, the child. Uh, some children come to term, they have fetal alcohol syndrome. But you can see that as a cause of some spontaneous abortions. Another one is multifactorial inheritance. You've got, you've, dad's got one set of mutations that he's fine with. Mom's got another set of mutations she's fine with. They come together and have a baby, and if the baby has both sets of mutations, no, that's not fine anymore. It's the combination that's going to cause the problems. And look here, here's the biggest category. Over half, we don't know. We've got a spontaneous abortion. Can't figure out what went wrong. Mom was taking care of herself, there were no environmental factors, there's nothing in the background of either parent that could affect this. Uh, you can't identify any mutations, the cells all look normal. It's just sometimes things go wrong. I know that's terrible to say, isn't it? That there's all these uncertainties in pregnancy. Uh, there they go. Okay, if we just look at the chromosome abnormalities down here, we find that about 25% of those, of that 7%, are polyploid. Yeah, they have that 69 chromosomes, or they have 115 chromosomes, whatever. They've got an excess of chromosomes. Uh, that is never viable, not in humans. So they don't make it to term. Uh, another common one is this one, monosomic X. We're going to see that often monosomic X can survive. They make it to adulthood. In fact, often they're kind of hard to distinguish from um, individuals without any genetic abnormalities. But they also have a high frequency of spontaneous abortions. Trisomies, about 50% are trisomic and about 5% have other miscellaneous, and we'll get to some of those in a little bit. So basically we're saying here, uh, pregnancy is a crapshoot. You got a pretty good chance of things going wrong. It's kind of a miracle that you get through this. And look at you, you're all born. And you're all pretty healthy, I presume. So, you know, this, this just happens. Okay, how big is this problem? Uh, humans are terrible at reproduction. 
Yeah, the, the way we make up for it is that we have sex all the time. Make lots of babies and a number of them will survive. Uh, but like it says here, at least half of all human conceptions end in spontaneous abortion. Yeah, so you get pregnant, you think, oh, things are great. And then all of a sudden, poof, it's gone. This happens all the time. I've, I've known many women who've experienced this. They really want to have a baby. They're trying. They try for years. They don't get any. They get one. It spontaneously aborts. Uh, often what's happening here is that many of these cases they don't even know about. You think you might be pregnant, but then uh, it just, you just think, oh, hey, just my period was late. A month later, you think, oh, I'm fine. You may have had a spontaneous abortion. Not if you didn't have sex, of course. But this often happens that spontaneous, so spontaneous abortions happen quietly in the first month of pregnancy. Just quietly gone. You just think your period was late. Okay, so when they examine those, when you look at these known spontaneously aborted fetuses in the first month of the pregnancy, about 60% are aneuploid. So, like I said, we don't do very good at this business. Humans are pretty bad at producing babies. And the mechanism that nature has chosen for us to produce healthy offspring is uh, just make lots of babies and have the weak ones die. Okay, antibody though is relatively rare in, at, in humans brought to term. And relatively is a big broad word and we'll see some examples of that frequency in a moment. Okay, so we have all these problems Here's another thing, though, that sort of softens the blow. Uh, genetic mosaicism and chimerism. Those also seem to be pretty common. It's hard to assess, but I wouldn't be surprised if basically everyone was chimeric or mosaic to some degree. So what does this mean? Well, this means you get fertilization of an egg, you produce a zygote, it starts dividing to produce a fetus. Each of these divisions has an opportunity for things like non-disjunction or for mutation. And so what can happen is you can be going along producing this, this little fetus and one of the cells gets a non-lethal mutation. It gets a change in its characteristics or it goes through a non-disjunction, things like that. And then it produces a mass of cells in the fetus in which there's a mix. Some are carrying the mutation, others are not. And then the individual can be born and grow up and you can get things like this, where there are actually patterns of cell types in the tissues of the individual that can be observed they're not always visible as pigmentation, though, for instance. Some of them require, ah, you gotta take a biopsy needle and pull out cells, you gotta go check them out in the microscope, cool things like that. Uh, but yeah, we get these patterns. So this is a, mo a, a mosaic individual. You can get a similar sort of thing. You may occasionally hear about this in the news. Uh, this is a chimera. She looks perfectly normal. But for instance, if the initial pregnancy was producing twins, and then one of those twins gets resorbed into the other one, gets taken over, you end up with a chimera. She is made up of some tissues from her lost twin. And this, this happens surprisingly often. There have been a number of cases where they go in and they sequence a piece of a, a person's body and discover it's got a very different genotype than another piece of tissue for that same individual. I think this was in an episode of House once, wasn't it? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, they throw those things into these, these medical shows where 
Yeah, it can happen. Uh, so you get these, these mosaic patterns or chimeric patterns. Uh, this just illustrates something that is kind of neat that I, I'm personally fascinated by. It crops up every once in a while. These are called Vlashko's lines that you can get a pattern. Of, this is a clone of brown cells are a clone of cells with a slightly different genotype than the pink colored ones. And as development proceeds, you know, you start off with this stubby little embryo and it's going to stretch and grow longer. And that clone of cells gets stretched out. And those cells may also be migratory. They may move out into the body and they form these arcs that represent the movement of the individual cells of the clone through the embryo, which is pretty cool. Uh, you sometimes get these patterns as well checkerboard patterns. Again, Blaschko's lines, uh, they've been frequently observed, but they're not all that common. It's not all that common that the particular mutation or change in the cells is associated with a pigment difference. It all has to be inferred later by biochemical studies. Okay, but so some of you here may be mosaic you may have incorporated a twin from a pr the pregnancy. How do you know? Again, it takes some fairly sophisticated tests to figure that out. But the nice thing about this, here's the advantage to this. If you're talking about a, a mutation, an aneuploidy, for instance, that is strongly deleterious and that would normally kill the individual, uh, one way we can soften the blow is if that individual is mosaic and has a pattern of some cells carry the mutation, others do not. So then they, the, that individual can survive to a better degree. And we think many of the aneuploidies we see actually are examples of mosaicism. That what is, has happened is, for instance, you can fertilize an egg, produce an aneuploid zygote, and it goes through a series of divisions, and you can actually have a second non-disjunction that duplicates the chromosome that was missing. And then you're fine, with some exceptions. Again, we'll get to those exceptions later in the course. Okay. There are a bunch of known human aneuploidies. These are aneuploidies that typically make it to at least birth. So most of them, however, involve the sex chromosomes. Remember, sex chromosomes already have built-in mechanisms for dosage compensation. So that's good. You've got a variation in the number of sex chromosomes. Your body knows to shut some of them down. Also, the Y chromosome. Who cares about the Y chromosome? It's got fairly few genes on it. It's got next to nothing on it. So what if it's duplicated? Okay, so we've got these mechanisms that compensate for this. Uh, here are the known aneuploidies. That is, aneuploidies that make it to term. So we've got Turner syndrome, Klinefelter syndrome, Jacob syndrome, Down syndrome. Uh, first of all, those, these first three. Those are sex chromosome aneuploidies, and they're relatively common. Uh, then we have Down syndrome. We all know that one. Uh, these you probably have never heard of before. Uh, Patel syndrome and Edwards syndrome are trisomies of chromosome 13 and 18, and uh, they are particularly tragic because these are children who come to term. They're born and they've got such severe deformities, they typically die within six months. Which is why you don't see them. Cree du Chat syndrome is, um, that one is where you're missing a portion of a chromosome, you're missing a whole bunch of genes. Uh, this is also a pretty severe syndrome. Uh, you are not gonna see individuals with Cree du Chat syndrome walking around either, they're typically institutionalized but they can make it to adulthood. Okay, let's look at each one of these. 
So here's a really common one. This is uh, Turner syndrome. Has an instance of one in 3,000 births. So, you know, just if you think of it in a statistical way, there are a couple of people with Turner syndrome living in Stevens County, for instance. It's, it's that common. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a high frequency of spontaneous abortions. And many that come to term are probably mosaic. Okay, so they've got a patchwork of cells. Uh, and just whether they get the right arrangement is what permits them to survive. And this is what the karyotype looks like. You see right there, there's that lonely X chromosome all by itself. No Y chromosome, no complementary X chromosome. So as you might imagine, Turner syndrome uh, individuals are more likely to be colorblind, as you can see why. Uh, they do not have a bar body in their cells, even though they appear perfectly normal as females. Okay, here's what they look like. Uh, relatively normal. At birth, they're not readily distinguishable from a kid who's got the normal uh, X chromosome complement. Uh, so, relatively normal, but they tend to have a slow growth rate. And again, that varies so much in humans. You know, you all know, nah, maybe you don't, but if you've got friends and family who've had children, you know, there's tremendous variation in the growth rate. You know, that uh, your kid is at the 50th percentile of the sixth month, they'll say. That's average. Or it's below 50%. Or it's above. It really doesn't make any difference. It just, it's just used as an indicator to see, well, you know, maybe, maybe the kid's not getting enough good nutrition here. Or maybe he's porking out too much. Whatever. You want to you wanna check the kids for that. But there's a huge amount of variation. So often this goes undiagnosed. You got a baby girl. She looks fine. Yes, that kid actually looks fine. And uh, she just grows a little more slowly than others. Things that do show up is this thing here. See there? They tend to have little folds of skin at their neck. Not always, but it's a fairly common effect. Uh, it's called webbing. So you got webbing of the neck. Uh, you may also see uh, it's called a shield chest. They've got widely spaced nipples. Again, how would you know? Do you go around and measure your friend's nipple distance? No. Doctors, doctors will notice. They'll look at it. But it's not something that's going to jump out at an individual about, about somebody you know. You will also sometimes see this. And I've got to warn you about a lot of these studies. I don't trust them. I don't believe them. Back in the back in the fifties, when a lot of these studies were done, uh, there was widespread bias. Uh, yeah, if you're a girl, you're not as smart as the boys, and you're not as good at math and spatial perception. And you know that three D rotation game you do on some of those standardized tests. Uh, this is probably not true. But I see it reported all the time. Just when you see discussions of, of IQ and normal IQ and specific things like math and spatial perception in uh, sexually biased studies, you, you, you got to be kind of doubtful about them. Yeah, maybe there is something here, but uh, I would like to see better studies in this. Now, here's the other big problem. It's like I said, you have this normal baby girl, she's fine. She grows up, she reaches adolescence, and then this happens. They fail to de develop normal secondary sexual characteristics. So something is going on. Uh, this is often when they are diagnosed, is it adolescence? You've got a girl who's just not developing as 
as much as her peers. So let's take her in and get her checked out. Um, and then unfortunately you discover this other tragic thing about it. They are typically infertile. So you get this diagnosis that, hey, you're not, you're not getting, you're not developing breasts like the other girls. And also, you're infertile. This is not good news for most girls, right? So you gotta be a little bit sensitive about that sort of thing. Um, yeah, you may be also be asked to pose for a doctor like this. I can't even imagine a 13 or 14 year old being asked to do that. Yeah, the literature is full of it. I've obscured some parts of it. Okay, uh, so we got these problems of development, puberty. Uh, they also have an increased incidence of cardiac and renal disease. There seem to be some protective functions of the X chromosome. Uh, by only having one copy, you've lost some of them. You might notice that men also have a higher incidence of cardiac disease. Does that have something to do with that? Could be. Okay, so that's Turner syndrome. Here's the complement. Uh, this is called Klinefelter syndrome. Look at the frequency of this, one in 500 births. That means if we just play the odds, there's a couple of students at UMM who are probably Kleinfelters. Uh, this includes all kinds of variants. Look there, all that matters is you got multiple X chromosomes and you got a Y chromosome sitting here. This one's XXY, which can also be XXXY. I've seen reports of like up to six X chromosomes and a single Y chromosome, and they present as males. Just the Y chromosome is typically enough to trigger normal male development. But it's pretty common. It's not as deleterious as Turner syndrome, as you might guess, so because it's much more common. Uh, and the reason again is, who cares about the Y chromosome? It just doesn't have much on it. It's not affecting the dosage very much. Most of the genes have normal dosage here. The only difference is you got that extra X, which has some antagonistic functions to what the X chromosome does. Okay, here's, here's what they look like. So if you've got Klinefelter syndrome, you tend to be taller than average. They also tend to be thin and kind of lanky looking, like this individual here. Uh, reports say low average IQ. I can't tell you how doubtful I am about any measurement of IQ in an individual like this. This is an individual who's got some uh, striking morphological differences from his peers. And that can affect social acceptance it can affect uh, their treatment at school, for instance. It's really hard to look at this and, and say, oh no, there were no cascading effects of these other phenomena that might have affected his intelligence. So once again, they're infertile. They have male sexual characteristics that fail to develop at puberty. Again, that's when they often get diagnosed, is you've got a normal baby boy growing up perfectly normally, and then puberty rolls around, and uh, sorry, no pubic hair, no, no armpit hair, none of that kind of stuff. Uh, also, the doctor may notice this, that they have small testicles, they may have a high-pitched voice, as you can see in this individual, slightly wider hips. Uh, they may also get partial breast development when they hit puberty. This isn't supposed to happen. Boys, when they hit puberty, are not supposed to grow breasts, right? But these individuals, that may happen. Again, keep in mind, there's a huge amount of variation in the normal genetically population. So this sometimes slips right by everybody. You just got a skinny kid with a higher pitched voice fits right in otherwise, right? So uh, what do you do? But then, then you discover that about 5% of the males at fertility clinics are found to have Klinefelters. 
So that tells you something as well. These individuals go through their life perfectly normally, they're healthy, they've got normal relationships, they get married, they want to have kids, they start having problems, and when they have problems they go to the fertility clinics to find out, and that's when they find out they've got Klein filters. Okay. Uh, this over here is just a section through a testis showing that some of the cell, and I should probably cut that out, you guys don't care. Uh, we're not talking about the histology of the gonads, but yeah, there's subtle differences in the testis. Okay, so that's Klinefelter syndrome. Again, fairly common, and it's just XXY. Remember we talked about calico cats? I told you, okay, calico cats are all female. Right, because the, the reason you get the calico effect is inactivation of one of the X chromosomes. That's not always true. Uh, this is a show cat. This is a Maine Coon. His name is Don Treader, Texas Cowboy. Yeah, people who, people who have show cats give them strange names. But anyway, uh, he's, he's a really interesting cat because he won a number of cat show contests, just being a really beautiful calico cat. And then they discovered, oh, wait, this is a boy calico cat. This is weird. Uh, there were uh, there were some contentious goings on here. Uh, I just include this link here because it's a really it's a really kind of entertaining story. Is this poor cat goes to all these shows? And about half of the shows he went to said, oh, great, this is a beautiful cat. Here's a blue ribbon or whatever. The other half say, oh, no, you're an abomination. You can't be in this show. And they kicked him out. Uh, so there was a big struggle in the, uh, in the breeders' groups about whether you should be able to accept this bizarre mutant cat who's got XXY chromosomes. Yeah, it's still unsettled. Uh, last I heard, they changed some of the bylaws to exclude conditions like this. Also interesting about this cat is, okay, he's, he's XXY. He's like a Kleinfelter's cat, right? And he's going to be sterile. The owners were greatly surprised when they discovered that this cat that they thought they didn't have to take in to get neutered was fathering cats all over the place. So he was having lots of little baby kittens. But he's climb filters. That shouldn't happen. This, this says, no, you're sterile. Again, uh, remember mosaicism? They did a fairly careful analysis of this cat and they discovered, yeah, big chunks of his reproductive tract are XY. So somewhere there they lost the extra X. The rest of his body is XXY. By just around the reproductive system, there it is, XY. So he was able to reproduce. So again, if we step back to that previous slide here. Yeah, we say infertile. That may not be the case. Depends on mosaicism. That's a big factor contributing to this. So some of this may, we, there may be individuals who have been Diagnosed as normal genetically, and yet they may actually be Klein filters in certain tissues of the body. Genetics is complicated, right? Okay, here's another one. This is this is called Jacob syndrome. It's XYY. There we go. Uh, this is called X Y XYY. They've got an extra Y chromosome. And like I said earlier, who cares about the Y chromosome? There's almost nothing on it. So what about, what are these people like? Well, this is where we get into some more of the sociology of genetics. Uh, kind of the ugly sociology of, of genetics. Uh, one study was done in which they surveyed penal institutions. They went to prisons. They just asked around and they did these tests and they said, uh, one in 25 men are X, Y, Y. And this kind of fit with their preconceptions. Everyone knows men are violent and aggressive, right? 
You all agree? No? Okay. This, was, this is the stereotype. Men are more aggressive. They're more violent. Uh, maybe it's because the Y chromosome contains a violence gene. So if you get a double dose of the Y chromosome, you're going to be more violent than even a regular man. And so you're going to get thrown into prisons. So they did this study. They found this, again, a very dubious number. I don't know if I believe this at all. Because, of course, the other problem is if you have any kind of genetic disorder, it makes you stand out. It, it, it's not to say that this does not have any effect at all. It's to say it does have subtle effects, but it may be a subtle effect that then leads to mistreatment in society, leads to other problems, leads to you going to prison. Uh, what other things we know about it? Well, it's you're tall. It seems like having a Y chromosome does contribute to height. Uh, we also have a higher incident of incidence of learning disabilities. Again, the, this stuff is so tricky. It's why geneticists need sociologists to help them out in their studies. Uh, sure, maybe they've got a higher incidence of learning disabilities because they've got these other problems. And uh, that leads to, that lead, one thing leads to another, and you get disabilities, and then of course you get imprisoned, all these other things can happen. However, they are perfectly fertile. And this kind of makes sense as well. Remember that I told you that on the X chromosome there were genes that opposed the Y chromosome. For instance, DAX. This individual has one copy of DAX. Just like me. And he's got two Y chromosomes. Again, that just means he's got an earlier trigger for the development of male characteristics. That's all it means. So it's not too surprising that they come out with normal sexual development. Okay. Here's another one. Back when I was taking genetics, uh, they called these super females. Yeah, we gotta, we got to get rid of some of the baggage in genetics. So that's an example of that. So trisomy X means you've got an individual that's XXX. Uh, I've seen some magazine articles that turn this into something racy, right? Triple X, oh man. This, this is like a porn star number, right? Um, uh, one in 1,400 females have this condition. It doesn't do anything. It, all it means is they've got two bar bodies, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but we have all these dosage compensation mechanisms for excess X's, and so they just shut down the other one. Uh, they are indistinguishable from XX females. No, they don't have those problems when they hit puberty, like Turner syndrome. They just don't experience, they're, they just, they're indistinguishable. And no, most importantly, they do not develop gigantic breasts, right? They don't become oversexed, nothing like that. They are indistinguishable from other girls their age. Uh, again, there's this thing, oh, they may have a slightly reduced IQ. Do I have to give you the spiel again? I just don't trust this stuff. Uh, it's too often it's a consequence of stereotypes about women. Uh, women are less smart. They have poor spatial ability, that kind of stuff. So, of course, if they've got three X chromosomes, they must be even worse. Uh, this has not been adequately tested. They are also fertile. But because they got this, you know, about half their gametes will be XX and the other half will be X. It means they have a higher incidence of passing on the sex chromosome abnormalities to their children. Right? So they're more likely to have a Klinefelter son if you've got this condition. But otherwise, they're fine. They, they, they can function just beautifully. Okay, here's a case where they don't function quite as well. Uh, this is uh, Down syndrome. Oh, look at those numbers, 1 in 800. 
on average. At your ages, you're much less likely to have a Down syndrome child. But if you get up into your late 30s and 40s, you're more likely. So we get this kind of variation. Um, so the incident increases with the age of the mother. Uh, also notice here, three chromosome 21. Uh, this, by the way, is not something to say that it's all the it's all the women's fault, because studies have also found that older men, with their worn out, tired sperm, are more likely to father um, other kinds of problems. Like schizophrenia has been found to be associated with the age of the father. But this one, yeah, clearly it has something to do with the age of the mother. Uh, partly, this is because. Human women, you know, you, you made all your eggs as, an, as a fetus and as a young infant and sequestered them and they're all just sitting there in your ovaries waiting for their moment. So these are old eggs as well, old cells. And cells will accru accrue detriments the older they get. So that's probably the cause of this particular effect. All right, notice, this is the only viable autosomal trisomy. If you try this with any of the chromosomes, three chromosome ones, three chromosome sevens, three chromosome nine, no, you don't make it. That's, that's a death sentence. Uh, the symptoms of this are a number of things here. So hypotonin, relaxed muscles. Uh, their facial features, they typically have a short, broad nose. They have stubby hands with a semi-increase. It just means, you know, if, I, if I look at my hand here, I got a crease here, and a crease here, and I got a crease up here. Uh, individuals with a semi-increase do not have this top one. They just have this middle one going across. So that's what you're seeing there. Yes, I see you looking at your hands. Are you monkeys, or are you men, or women? Yeah. Uh, this, this, uh, this also occurs in uh, people who are not Down syndrome, so it's not entirely diagnostic. A good friend of mine uh, had a semi-increase. He was a college professor. You know, so it's like, no, don't worry about it. Okay, uh, another thing, uh, it's common to have this epicanthic fold. That crops up in a number of these syndromes. Uh, they have a small mouth and a large furrowed tongue. So there's some differences in the proportions of some of their tissues. Uh, this leads to the, the common slur of calling somebody a mouth breather, right? If you're a mouth breather, you're not very bright. You get your mouth thing, it it's, comes from this. That's not their fault. They've got a small mouth, they've got a large tongue. So they've also got, often got this kind of posture. Uh, I should mention as well that there's a huge amount of variation in Down syndrome. I saw in the news just recently that there is a woman who is a Down syndrome woman who is going to be a model for Victoria's Secret. You've seen that too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that just tells you, you know, don't, don't go by just the stereotypes. You have to assess individuals as individuals. And there's a huge range of variation. And the phenotype. They just have some common traits here. Uh, females can have children. Of course, if they have children, half of them will have Down syndrome. Yeah, because you know their gametes. Some of the gametes will have one chromosome 21. Others will have two chromosome. Yeah, leads to an increased incidence of, of Down syndrome. Uh, this may be a problem in some institutional settings. You've got a large number of Down syndrome women in your institution. Uh, you can't just close your eyes and pretend they don't have sex. So things like contraceptives and things like that are a good idea. Males, however, are infertile. They're just not going. They're not going to make babies. Okay, so that's that's Down syndrome. It's a really common thing. Uh, we've, got, we've got a couple of facilities here in Morris, for instance, where we have Down syndrome children. 
Again, because of that huge range of variation, some Down syndrome children need to be institutionalized. They're so profoundly mentally deficient that they can't cope on their own. And then on the other side of it, there are Down syndrome children who are just fine, can be brought up into the workplace and can get things done without anyone needing to hold their hand. Okay, some, some of the bad ones. Uh, this is Patel syndrome. It's really rare. Look at there, one in 19,000 births. So it's very uncommon. It's caused by trisomy 13. Uh, when it does occur, though, it is terrible. Okay. Yeah, sorry, this is, this is a really sad picture to look at. This is a typical Patel syndrome child. Uh, you can see that there's a bunch of things that have gone wrong with this poor baby. Uh, microcephaly, not obvious in this one, but reduced brain size. Uh, they are severely retarded. They often have cleft lip and palate. You can sort of see that over here. Uh, deformed ears, they're deaf. These tissues up here, they are really sensitive to dosage, uh, gene dosage. And they're a common target of these kinds of anomalies. They also have heart defects. I should have mentioned Down syndrome also, also often has heart defects associated with it. So again, this is a common thing. You've got this really delicate, delicate essential organ it has to have appropriate morphology to do its job. And if you've got these major changes in the chromosome or gene dosage, uh, they can be perturbed. So these individuals also have serious heart defects. They often have polydactyly, more than five fingers. That's a weird one. Uh, another one is cryptorchidism. Uh, orchid is a technical medical term referring to testes again. So they, they, they don't have descended testes if they're male. And here is the big one. They're dead by three months. So this is the child when born who needs chronic continuous care because they're not doing well. They're kind of helpless. They're not going to learn. And uh, then by three months, they're going to die, usually because of this heart defects. They do make it to term, though. That's, that's all you can say. All right, this is another one. This is called Edwards syndrome. <clears throat> Did I have, I think I skipped over. Yeah, that's just Edwards syndrome. You got an extra chromosome 18, low frequency, one in 8,000 births. And, uh, you know, there are two big organs that have to be just exactly right to do their job the heart and the brain, and these are often the ones that are most likely to be messed up by these dosage problems. So they have a profound mental retardation, although it's hard to tell because they're only going to live a few months. Uh, they have an elongate skull, it's kind of stretched out this way. They have deformed ears, you can see it there. Uh, they have that webbed neck that we saw in Turner syndrome. And they have serious hip deformities. Now, this stuff does not form. It does not form properly. So they're, they're born with, for instance, dislocated hips. Uh, they have heart defects. No surprise there. Uh, they also have this thing called rocker bottom feet. You can sort of see there. You know how you've got an arch in your foot? It's supposed to be like this. Theirs are like this. The bones of the foot don't form properly. And so they you get this rocker bottom foot effect. Um, and also they have this characteristic fist they make. I can't even do that. They just typically fold their hands in a particular way. So it's little things like that that, uh, you know, obstetrics nurses will be able to recognize if they come up often enough and can spot these sort of symptoms and immediately get this child in for intensive care 
which won't help because they will die by the time they're four months old. Yes, am I doing my part to uh, urge you to use birth control, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty scary stuff when you get right down to it. Okay. <clears throat> Cree du Chat syndrome. Uh, look at that. There, one in 50,000 births. It's really uncommon. Uh, what that is, is there's chromosome 5, and they've lost just a portion of the small end of chromosome 5. That's it. Normally, uh, any kind of aneuploidy that leads to the loss of a whole chromosome, nope, you're not going to make it, that's no good. Uh, this is a case where you can lose a part of a chromosome and you'll, you'll still survive for a while. Okay, here's what they look like. Uh, they look reasonably normal, right? Uh, they tend to have microcephaly, so they have small skull, small brain. They do have mental retardation, sometimes very profound mental retardation. As is typical, heart defects. Yeah, heart defects always crop up in these things. Uh, they also have abnormal development of the larynx and epiglottis, which leads to the name, cry of the cat syndrome. I've, I've heard these kids, and it's in some ways it's kind of chilling, because they literally sound like my cat when it's hungry. Just this, this kind of high-pitched yowl. Yeah, so they have serious problems there. Um, it's a real problem for the families with these kids because, you know, babies crying is awful. You can't stand it. it even somebody who's been a parent three times like me drove me crazy, drove my wife crazy because Kids know how to fire off an alarm to get you to come running to take care of them. Uh, these individuals, uh, it, it's an alarm that makes you want to leave the room. Just sounds like a shrieking cat. And again, not their fault. It's just tragic. Uh, these individuals can live to adulthood, although typically they're going to be institutionalized. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, it gets categorized as a, as a defect of the chromosomes, but it probably shouldn't. It's called Fragile X. And you can see what it looks like over here. Uh, it, it has these little constrictions in the X chromosome. And if you culture these cells, they will often lose portions of the X chromosome. It will just kind of fall off there. Uh, it doesn't seem to happen in the, in the surviving individual. Uh, so it's, it's just a weird little thing when you get this tight construction there. Uh, it's got a higher incidence in males than in females, as you might expect. It's X chromosome associated. It is dominant. So it's a dominant, excellent trait with variable expressivity. What does that mean? That means that you may have it but not express the fragile X phenotype. I have one minute. I'll just race through this real quick. Okay, fragile X, uh, what it leads to is things like mental retardation. Uh, it leads to macro orchidism. Remember what orchid refers to here. So they have enlarged testicles. They have a characteristic sh facial shape. They're recognizable, they have a long, thin face, a prominent jaw, they have large ears, uh, they have s substantial developmental delays, and they're often autistic. This is a really common syndrome. Lots of people have this. Uh, and they're, they're often at a point where they can, yeah, you can go to school, you can join, mingle with your others, uh, but then they'll have some mental problems that lead to all kinds of difficulties. The cause of fragile X is a trinucleotide repeat. Where have I mentioned trinucleotide repeats before? Anyone remember? Remember Woody Guthrie? Huntington's disease? Yeah, vaguely you recall. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there, and we will pick up with this bit of the story on Monday. I'm going to have a bunch more strange things that can happen to chromosomes that we'll talk about.